Thanks, Brian. Good okay. afternoon, everybody. Oops, I thought he was going to jump back in there. Um, my name is Michelle Probert. I use she, her pronouns. I am the director for the Office of Main Care Services. And thank you all for joining us this afternoon. It's great to have a robust group. Um, as uh, I certainly hope, since you all are here, uh, we are here today to kick off our first um, rate reform work group, specifically for uh, our nursing facility as well as residential care facility rate reform project. Um, and before, just to clarify, um, should we be doing introductions now or is Guidehouse going to take that uh, after I say a couple words? Um, I don't think we are gonna do full introductions um, given that we only have an hour, um, but we can certainly introduce as, as folks present their slides. Yep, okay, that sounds fine. And I didn't mean everybody in the uh, entire, okay. entire group. Um, but uh, thanks for that, Justin. Um, so I just wanted to say that uh, first I wanted to give thanks to Angela Westhoff as well as uh, Lisa Henderson, um, respectively from Maine Healthcare Association and Leading Age uh, for their help mm -hmm. in pulling this group together today. Uh, we really appreciate them lending us their expertise in terms of who all you are and the facilities you represent to help us make sure that we've got a good diverse group uh, in terms of kinds of facilities and the different um, pressures and cost drivers you all may face. So thank you to Angela and Lisa. And um, I will fully acknowledge that the devil is always in the details, uh, but I am truly excited to start this work because I do feel like there are a number of shared objectives for all of us. Uh, and those include moving to a system uh, where there will be reduced administrative burden is a goal. Um, the, the, another goal is to make sure that our reimbursement rates uh, and our methodology is fair as well as equitable, that we want to have a reimbursement system that rewards quality care that is provided to residents, uh, and that we also want to make sure that our rates are sufficient to cover reasonable costs. Uh, so those, um, those are the objectives that I think that we can all get on board with. Um, and like I said, uh, devil's in the details and it's never easy, but we've got a ro robust group here to make sure that we stay on the right track and, and really have a good basis of information and data and perspectives and experience to help inform that process. So with that, uh, I will turn it back to Guidehouse um, and look forward to the discussion, thanks. All right, just to make sure everyone can see my screen, they're seeing the uh, PowerPoint presentation. All right, David, I will turn it over to you to start. David. I think I was on mute. I'll try that again. Can there people hear me? <laughs> All right. Yep. Uh, uh, welcome. Welcome again. Um, my name is David Garbarino. I am a director here at Guidehouse and I'm the overall engagement director on this project. So today we kind of have two key things that we want to accomplish in the next over the next 55 minutes or so. This this presentation, if you will, is broken up into two halves. And I use the word presentation lightly because we're really not presenting to you because we're here to gather information from you. But we're going to give you sort of um, a, a quick overview of what we're what we're trying to do, how we're going to go about doing it, some of our thoughts on rate setting in the first half, and that's going to take approximately 20, 25 minutes. And then the remaining time, we have an exercise that we'd like to do with all of you um, built around three questions that we'd love for you to opine on. So um, that's how it's how the structure is going to go. And so let's jump right in. Uh, next slide. So again, we're here. Here, as you heard um, Michelle say, you know the objectives that Maine Care has laid out for the next generation of rates for nursing facilities and um, RCFs. Some of the things that you know we're thinking about doing is uh, understanding how different payment models affect will affect different providers and the residents. Looking at quality and fiscal goals, um, we we want to hear your feedback and your input 
on things that we should consider. So ultimately, when we make a recommendation to main care, your thoughts are captured in that recommendation. Um, and then one of the things in addition to rates we're gonna be evaluating is case mix and risk adjusting options that we, um, that we can use. Next slide. So the purpose, th this slide here really is a reference because I'm sure everyone on this call, whether you be a nursing facility or an RCF knows how you are paid today. So we put this here for reference because it's the baseline, right? This is the, this is the baseline from which we are building going forward today, ultimately heading towards that 1125 um, um, rollout of new, new rates. So, you know, the current um, NIF methodology is largely cost-based. You know, there are some caps and, and there is a, an acuity adjustment on the direct care component. Of course, is the, you know, it honors the quadruple A requirement of paying 125% for the state minimum wage. And that will, of course, continue on. Um, and we're aware that today, you know, the rate is rebased every couple of years. For the RCFs or PNMIC level four, you know, the rate is also a per diem, but it's a little bit different than the nursing facilities. Is, you know, it, it's based on the two components um, and it does have a peer group based acuity method. Again, I'm sure you are all um, as familiar as we are, if not more with that methodology. But we put this here for, for not as a discussion point, but as a point of reference for you to then build upon as we think about where we're going in the future. Next slide. So what is our approach to developing new rates? Well, you know, at, 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 the, at its highest level, we're, you know, we are moving away from a strictly cost reimbursed method to, to a methodology that is in part or whole based on a prospective system. Where that line is drawn, to be determined. You know, I, I presume there'll be some elements that will be cost settled. There'll be some elements that will be based on a prospective rate. Our goal is to keep what works and update what doesn't. You know, we, the methodology has been around for a number of years. We had a we had a good history lesson um, from main care on 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 how things have changed over the years, and there may be things that we go back to things that you know folks say you know that worked, and you know but we moved on from it and we may bring it back. So really, everything's on the table when we think about a new methodology. As Michelle said, quality is a is a big issue. We want to prioritize and incent quality to you know that will um, maximize um, uh, resident um, outcome, quality of life and all the things associated there. We'll be incorporating an acuity measure. You know, today, at least for the nursing facilities, the, um, the direct cost is risk adjusted. We'll look at that. Potentially we will continue in that vein or we will expand it to the entire, to the entire rate. We'll look at um, a couple of different acuity methodologies. Again, your input is welcome. Same for the RCFs. Um, they, you know, they currently have um, an in-house method, and that's in there, and that's being looked at, and we will look at that as well. And then, lastly, as we think about you know these rates, there's a component of value-based care that we want to incorporate. And, and what do we mean by that? Because main care has identified a handful of things, including quality, fair and equitable, reduced administrative burden. We want to develop mm -hmm. a methodology okay. that potentially incents. Um, and send some of the behaviors that are priorities for the department. So that's what we mean when we say value-based payment. Um, next slide. So I think at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Justin Rutter, who will walk through some of the components that will be included in the future rate, rate program. Thank you, David. Uh, my name is Justin Rutter. I'm the overall project manager for this engagement from GuideHouse. And although we're still gonna be working with you all and gathering your feedback on what development approach we really wanna to take to rate setting, there's kind of general themes that are gonna follow uh, no matter what methodology we choose. And this is a graphic just to dis display the building blocks of nurse facility and RCF rate setting. So we really kind of break it out into four quadrants. Um, one being kind of the costs that are built into our base rate. Um, things we may look at as part of our rate setting process, such as uh, location, uh, the number of beds and occupancy currently uh, shown in the nursing facility and RCFs, as well as future. And then obviously we'll, we're using a base data set from 2020 through 2022, 
And we're projecting that out to a 2025 calendar year. So we'll have to build in trend in inflation, which we'll get into more detail on a future slide. Now, the purpose of that cost buildup is to recognize allowable costs covered for services. We wanna make sure that we're creating a robust view of provider costs uh, for the allowable cost covered services currently. As we go to the lower left, you'll see we'll look at considerations for resident specific needs, such as acuity level, ADL support, uh, risk adjustment, and other options that we will research and look into as part of our rate setting methodology. And then lastly, we wanted to point out that when developing both the base data and then the trend and the assumptions, uh, we want to have a robust view so we can not only validate the data, but also look at best practices in other states and other data sources. So our data sources and assumptions will be derived from state, national, and industry standard data to give us a full look at uh, the nursing facility market, not only in Maine, but throughout Medicaid in the country. And as the bottom, you see uh, the source of the design. Um, we're going to rely on best practices, rate methodologies that are observed both in Maine and throughout our work in other parts of the country. We're going to focus on DHH at DHHS's needs. And then we also want your feedback. We want stakeholder input to determine what is the best path forward to make sure that we're setting fair and equitable rates. On this slide, I won't go through all of these, but uh, this goes through our general approach to data sources that we'll look at uh, as part of this process. Now, this is not an all-inclusive list, and it also doesn't mean that we'll use all of these data sources, but things that we may look at uh, really focus on base data development. So for that, we'll look at main state cost report, CMS 2540 reports, as well as CMS data, ICRIS data. And then we'll also look at MMIS claims data as part of our base data development. Then when we get into inflation and trend, we're gonna look at a wide variety of sources, not only looking at just uh, observed trends from those uh, CMS data sources, but also future trends as we project out into the contract rate period. So for that, we'll rely on sources uh, such as BLS information that provides not only uh, main specific, but also national and Medicaid specific uh, different data sources that we can look at as part of our uh, trend development. And then finally, as we look at other adjustments and assumptions that we may build into our rate setting, we'll look at uh, data from the minimum data set to see how that may affect uh, acuity adjustments. We'll look at claims data um, and other data sources for potential risk adjustment methodologies. Um, and then other quality measures and other data sources that may be available for uh, use as we develop our overall rate setting methodology. And then finally, uh, we'll use a Insight Health or Insight Health Health Data, which is a guidehouse tool that we use that allows us to look uh, at the industry specific uh, information that's more detailed. That's at the county and the city level, and that allows to do kind of a um, uh, look at current occupancy and needs that may uh, be projected into the future. And finally, this is just kind of a uh, diagram that shows our approach to rate setting. So really you're looking at operating costs, which are direct and indirect. Um, so things like wages, benefits, um, administration, program support, items like that to build a base of the operating cost will include uh, a sum, or data for capital costs, such as building and equipment. We'll look at potential adjustments that we may make for things like occupancy standard and cost caps. And that will build us up to a total allowable costs, which will then use the allowable days that we see in the data and then apply the inflation or trend that we see to kind of build a base rate. And from there, we'll look at potential other adjustments and assumptions that will be built into rate setting, which could include risk adjustment, value-based purchasing, quality, and other adjustments uh, that we may build into our rate setting methodology. And now I'm gonna turn it over, we're gonna develop actuarial-based trends. So I'm gonna turn it over to our actuary, Erica Mitchell, to walk through our general approach to trend. Justin, um, I'm a fellow of the Society of Actuaries here with GuideHouse. I'm a director and I've been with the firm for about four years. 
Um, so as all of you are well aware, we're in a really unique economic environment um, in this point in time. And so what we want to do is build upon um, traditional rate setting capabilities around trend and bring a little bit of additional actuarial rigor and analysis to the work. Um, so as part of this, um, we'll start with trends using both historical main data as well as national data to project utilization costs from the midpoint of the base period to the midpoint of the cost uh, of the contract period. We'll be trending each facility um, from their respective year in through the midpoint of the rate. And, and the reason that that will differ facility by facility is that each facility's cost reports will, um, will end based on their own financial year end. So we wanna be sure that we're applying the proper number of months of trend, uh, given that some of, the, some of the cost reports utilized will be older and some will be newer. We'll be dividing the expenditure data into the three large buckets of direct, indirect, and capital expenses. And we'll be trending each of those separately. Um, as all of you are acutely aware, we've seen some enormous trends in the past couple of years on the direct, uh, the wage and salary trends. Um, so we wanna be sure that we're applying appropriate trends to this particular cost component where indirect and capital costs likely will be more using um, trends related to the producer price index. Each component uh, will be reviewed and based on actual observed trends and projected trends. And separate trends will be developed for the nursing facilities and the residential care facilities. We wanna make sure um, there are some nuances to each of these different provider groups and different cost splits. We wanna be sure that we're applying appropriate trend um, for each of these two different groups. We may make additional adjustments as well uh, for occupancy, quality, and other factors, depending on the final rate methodology chosen. So we, uh, we fully understand the importance of these assumptions, especially in this current economic environment. Uh, and as a result, we'll be doing a full deep dive on this, um, as well as risk adjustment in future meetings that we share with these stakeholders. If we go to the next slide. So currently the state, um, currently the state does have a degree of risk adjustment um, for the nursing facilities, as well as separately for the residential care facilities. This particular slide speaks a little bit more to the nursing facility risk adjustment that we anticipate. So one of the options that we have available to us uh, for risk adjustment is um, 3M has a broad array of tools. Um, it blends their clinical risk group and functional status group methodologies uh, to, to develop a more comprehensive risk adjustment. Um, one of the advantages to this 3M approach. So the CRGs are derived from coded claims information and primarily reflect the interaction and severity of chronic conditions. While the functional status data will, will take in from any measurement instrument targeting ADL or instrumental ADL data um, and, and uh, do an input both of the, the, chronic, um, the chronic conditions of the member as well as the functional status group to develop a much more comprehensive, well-rounded view of risk for the individual members. Other options for risk adjustment include um, CMS's patient-driven payment model or PDPM. Um, we probably will use this as some degree of a comparator um, given that this is a more national model and, and, um, and kind of what CMS uses. Uh, but we do want to be sure that we use um, this particular data with a little bit of caution because MACPAC and others um, have noted that one of the limitations of this particular model is that it leans very heavily on therapy utilization, while Medicaid members generally have more long stays and are less therapy intensive. So the utilization or through the appropriateness of the PDPM may not be quite as applicable for this Medicaid population as uh, Medicare more broadly. Um, and then we'll have the option to input other types of risk adjustment. Um, certainly we're open to feedback from the stakeholders about other considerations that we should be including. Um, but really the, the point of this overall uh, risk adjustment is to do our best to more, um, more concretely tie the member acuity to the payments that are being made so that for those facilities that have more acute membership, um, they are getting paid accordingly. And those with members that are less acute, the payment would also be reflective of that. So um, on the RCF side, the intent here is to pivot off of the current state model 
um, with additional adjustments such as um, the time study work that is being com uh, completed. So um, that's all I have. All right, and I am gonna turn it over here shortly to Danielle uh, to lead us through our group discussion. I will note we are gonna attempt to uh, copy and paste from the chat into this presentation. Um, so I'm gonna go out of full screen and hope that this works. So Danielle, if you'd like to take over. Sure, thanks, Justin. So yeah, this, this part of the conversation is going to be a little bit different. We're gonna to try to make it interactive. And so Justin is getting into our discussion slides, which, um, so, so we have three questions. We'll get there in a second. This whole portion of the focus group is gonna be about 30 minutes long. Um, so we have a few ground rules here. One is since we wanna get a lot of people talking, try to use the raise hand feature and here in Zoom, you'll see there's a button called reactions. And so if you click that, um, you should then see the raise hand feature. So be aware of that. If we're not talking, try to stay on mute just to minimize any um, background noise. And then if we could all come on video for part of the group, I know there's there should be about 17 to 20 folks we have for this. Um, and you know, being on video so we can talk to each other is you know the best experience for this. And then, like Justin noted, also um, we're going to use the chat box a lot. So if you want to click the icon that says chat, that should then pop up your chat box, and we're going to be responding to our questions that way too. So, Justin, we can get to the next slide. Thank you. So like I said, this, this portion of the session is gonna be about 30 minutes and we have three questions we're gonna talk through. Um, so we can go to the next slide and, and we can get started. So how this is gonna work. So I'll read the first question is, are there rate payment issues or current considerations you wish to share with the study team? So I'm gonna get a, give everyone a minute to think about what sort of rate payment issues or any other things you wanna talk about with us and please type them into the chat. So just think about it for a second and then we should see a, a lot of answers in the chat within the next you know, 30 seconds to a minute. That's why I have a timer here, so no worries. And Justin, you can also minimize that top ribbon in the PowerPoint to make the screen a little bit bigger. Uh, uh, yep. There we go. Okay, I'm not seeing anything yet. If we're having issues typing, you can also just um Discuss. Okay, I see. So Tammy's comment here. Thank you, Tammy. Don't be shy. All right, Angela. Let's see. Perfect. Okay, yeah. So Justin's going to be pasting those into the PowerPoint so we can kind of see all our answers together and then discuss them. Perfect. Okay, so we have Tammy and Angela. Perfect. Wanda put a message in. I know we have about 17 to 20 people here, so we should be getting a lot of answers. Perfect. Okay, some stuff. Oh, now they're coming in. All right, let me make sure I cut all these.
Okay. Thank you for these answers. Give me a few more seconds for Justin. Flying in. I know. It's, 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 it's <laughs> I apologize for my, my slow copy and paste, but no, I think you're you're uh, really right. doing well and we're getting a lot of answers. All right. So I think um boxes. Yeah. <laughs> uh Justin, you can keep doing that. And I think we can start talking about the answers. So so we're talking about what rate payment issues or conditions uh, or current considerations the study team should know about. So let's just start with number one. So number one's answer was capital reimbursement is retrospective, which is a strain on cash flow. So can whoever answered that please elaborate or kind of explain that answer a bit? Um, sure, this is Tammy Brunetti from Barry Dunn. Um, all of our, many of our facilities in the state of Maine are aging, uh, are quite old at this point, and uh, cash flow has just been, um, not been at a point where facilities can prospectively invest in, in their facilities. The reimbursement is retrospective, you know, and over the life of the, of the asset, um, so it's just putting a strain on cash flow and not incentivizing facilities to invest in, in their plant. Yeah. Does anyone else have um, agree with that or disagree with that answer? As a was that a answer or a question? I, I think what Tammy had was a question. I think that what she, the point she raises is very legitimate. Okay, so I'm sensing some agreements. Right, I brought that point up as a as a as a current uh, limitation factor in the current rate rate payment system or an issue, as you phrased it in the question. Absolutely, and and just to acknowledge, these are exactly the kind of points that we want to engage with. We may not have answers uh, to everything today, obviously, as we're just starting this process. Um, but absolutely, this is feedback we will review and incorporate as we start the rate setting process. All right, so let's see. Number two, rates are insufficient to cover costs of providing care. Long-term care providers experience year-over-year -year shortfalls. All right, we're gonna have to. Copy. Who wrote number two? That's me, Angela. Can you elaborate on that at all, Angela? Sure. No, I, I think it's um, <clears throat> pretty straightforward. Uh, what we see here at Maine Healthcare Association is year over year, there are structural shortfalls in the rate. Um, so we're looking at another $60 million between the cost of providing care and main care reimbursement for our Medicaid patients. So um, that happens on a pretty regular basis. And that's due in part to the way the system is structured with caps in place. Um, so I think that's something we need to look at going forward in a new model. Sure. Thank you. Let's let's skip to number seven. So someone wrote peer groups need realignment. Hi, this is Tammy Brunetti once again from Barry yeah, Dunn. Yeah. Um, currently, there are three peer groups in our system. Um, I would say smaller facilities, larger facilities, and hospital-based facilities. And you know those peer groups have been in place, um, and, and the way that they're differentiated have been in place, I think, for decades now. Um, and it's worth evaluating, you know, what types of facilities should be in which peer groups to determine medians. Um, you know, I, I think it's worth looking at to determine if, if the current peer group system is working as as it was intended. And Tammy, this is David. You're referring to the RCF. 
no, I'm, I'm referring to actually the, the nursing home. Okay. System. Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess the same could be true for the RCSF system in the, um, in the direct care pricer. Right. Um, you know, both of those systems, the peer groups were designed, you know, decades ago, and a lot has changed operationally in the industry since their inception. So if we're going to be looking at, you know, the, the overall rate structure, we might want to start from the, from the beginning, you know, from the base, which is the peer group. Yeah, I want you to hold that thought because that's actually something we, we will come back to and say, ask for a specific suggestions for peer groups, right? You could, you know, and feel free to, to opine on that, you know, in the chat as well, because that's, that's you know, very useful. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? Sure. Oh, I think you're, you're on, on mute, Phil. Still can't hear you, Phil. <laughs> Maybe you're double muted. Okay. Can you hear yeah. me now? Yes. yes. Okay. I, I just am wondering, we had posted some questions and somebody is deleting them or what's happening to the questions that were posted? Or, uh, well, now that I say that, it looks like they're back. Yeah, I had to put in a second slide because we had more than we, more uh, questions in boxes. So I just went to a second slide. To okay, I didn't know the why there was deletion going on. Thank you. Bill, fear, fear not, we are not deleting anything. <laughs> All right. Yeah, a lot of, lot of great answers here. So we're just gonna read through some of them. Um, so number four says rules regarding lesser and lessee arrangements and allowable costs are operational and prohibitive in today's environment. So how are they operationally prohibitive? Well, that's Tammy again. <laughs> um, Tammy. I have a lot of thoughts, but um, as you know, there's, you know, been some shifts in the industry of late and a lot of, you know, REITs sort of are operating the real estate of the of the uh, of the facilities and then we have operators as well. So um, essentially the operators are not getting any, you know, because of the age of the facility and the length that it's been operating and whatnot, operators are not getting are getting very, very, very little of their lease costs reimbursed, which is um, really creating going concern issues for a lot of a lot of those um, arrangements. And so, you know, we've seen sort of better, um, better reimbursement consideration for that in, in many other states than, than we have here in Maine. Okay. Thank you. Okay, let's see what else we have here. So can we talk a little about number five? which was submitted sure. by me. Yes, please. When uh, I question what the financial incentives are for anybody to want to get into this business. Um, there, 50 years ago, uh, there was a 10% return on equity that was guaranteed to anybody that opened a long-term care facility. That was eliminated, I believe, by the Angus King administration. Uh, these days, uh, and, and I will add to that, that when I look at uh, a grocery store that sells to food stamp recipients, which is a government aided program, they sell their groceries at the same price that they sell to, quote unquote, the private pay individual. Uh, LIHEAP pays heating oil dealers the uh, same price that they sell to everybody on the street. But I've never understood why it is that long-term care facilities are supposed to sell their product or service either at cost or for below cost. Because if the system that we have, if you do everything absolutely perfect, you break even. And so there's no financial gain for getting into the business to sell your service to the state of Maine. Uh, people who rent facility, who rent office buildings to the state of Maine 
are rewarded considerably better than any nursing home operator, and they're just providing an empty building. And so I, I've always been puzzled by the fact that why is it that you, you know, making a profit is prohibited? Because that, if that continues, who act, who is going to want to get into business, period? Yeah, that's a really good point. So we are going to jump to the next question in a minute. I just wanted to flip to maybe slide 14 to see if there's any other things to touch here before we do that, or if there's anyone that wants to jump in to explain their sticky note before we do so as well. And even if we don't talk about all these, we have all this information for the study team to look at. So don't worry if we don't mention it. Um, as long as we have your entry, it's going to be accounted for in this um, poll rates um, assessment. All right, well, let's go to slide 15 and then we can start talking about our second question for today. looks like my back yes sorry about <laughs> i was looking I for you dropped off the call for some reason all right let me no worries all right can you see my screen not yet so let me well our second question yep is what current rate components do you think are most valuable for us to study? So again, we're gonna give you a, about a minute to answer that in the chat, and then we'll start populating that in the slide for us all to discuss. So. Danielle, can you say, and you might've said this earlier, but can you say again, what you mean by a rate component? So I, I would say, for example, you know, you know, when you think about the building blocks that we talked about, in other words, will it be capital, direct, indirect, wages, acuity, um, you know, talk about quality, all the things that we sort of laid out that will go be going into the rate. We'd love folks to sort of opine on on their thoughts on those things. And, you know, for the folks who have, you know, you don't have to, if, you know, if because this question is sort of a variation to some degree on the first one, you don't have to sort of re-put in what you did in the first one, because again, as Danielle said, you saw Justin capture it. Everything you said has been captured. You saw it, we have the PowerPoint. Um, so if you have something, you know, something different or, or something you want to add to on, along this time, please, um, please opine. And David, in addition to the kind of cost that is important um, in terms of a rate component, are you also interested in knowing about like cost drivers? So some examples sure. being geography or, uh, pulling from the last slides, like uh, sure. dementia, you know, things that are impacting those costs. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. In other words, and anything that is, you know, I mean, because you think about the rate components, we, we talked about direct, indirect, and capital. What, you know, we, you know, in the previous um, question, we heard some things about some issues about capital, you know, but clearly a big driver is, is, you know, um, the makeup of the, of the population. So, you know, what, what are some of the, the components of the, of the residents you serve? So, you know, even though we have specific questions here, there's really no wrong answer. The idea is to hear from you, right? We'll, we'll put these into the right categories. We can, we can discern what we need to from your responses, but there's really no wrong response. Exactly. So we're getting a few answers now. We're seeing capital costs. We're seeing everything should have be reviewed. That's a great answer. Regulations. PNMI administrator reimbursements. Inflation adjustments. The cost of clinical care. Right, these are some good answers. All of them. Yeah. All of them, great. 
Does anyone want to elaborate on their answer so far? I know we still have some stuff coming in. And I have a list of people too, so we are not opposed to calling some folks out if we haven't heard from them yet. If I'd, I'd love to hear from whoever wrote um, number three, regulations continue to increase without rate components to align with new expenses. The person could expound on that. That's, you know, I'd love to hear more about that. Sure, that was me, David Dill. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, we get things, uh, something that stands out to me is, you know, we have to report a lot of things very often to the state. And those are, you know, just additional types of activities or costs that we have to account for, whether it's a capital investment of a new system or, you know, some other new way to track, track things. Um, but there's nothing really that aligns with that increased cost on our end, where regulation just creates more work for us to get through our daily tasks. Does that make sense? It actually does, because one of the things I think you heard at the onset by Michelle was to the extent possible, we want to try to reduce the administrative burden where appropriate. I mean, the state does have an interest in capturing information about, you know, about the operation, but I think that's worth consideration, you know. Yeah, even, you know, from a financial standpoint, you know, our um, the ability for us to bill electronically and get all of our remittance and stuff like that, even that's, you know. A, a huge cost to our industry. So if something like that were somehow to be improved upon, that would be a benefit versus when they add things to us, it just creates more work for us. If I can chime in on that, most of the new regulations come from CMS. Um, we, uh, prior to COVID, received 900 pages of newly revamped regulations, which expanded considerably a lot of former requirements. Uh, about six months ago, we received another 1,000 pages from CMS of new requirements, and there is no connection whatsoever between what CMS is demanding all facilities to do and what the state of Maine reimburses us. So how about, I see some answers here. Um, Glenn, can you elaborate on the labor costs comment that you put in? Yeah, this is Glenn Sear, Senior Vice President of Finance for North Country Associates. And it's no surprise that we are in a labor crisis. Um, the industry is on the verge of peril. And basically, it's all about labor. And I know historically over the last 30 years or so, it's always been about nursing uh, in terms of that's the highest percentage of our workforce. But it's more than that. Uh, we need services in all departments, including ancillary departments. And a good example of that is dietary services. We are now seeing that uh, some facilities have to get dietary services third party contracted to be able to provide food for our residents. And so there needs to be a mechanism for funding when it comes to labor costs. And really what happens is because the industry is slow to move, and I don't mean that in a negative way, I mean it in a way, the way that it's designed, there has to be nimbleness to give interim funding to providers to be able to deal with the fast moving reimbursement and expenditure costs that we're facing. It's no surprise that everyone on this call knows that nursing agency services is going to cripple this industry over the next couple of years and there needs to be some sort of mechanism in there to support facilities to be able to deal with this until there's some more substantial um, legislation in the area of third party nursing. And this is going to be the number one issue. So that's why in my first comment, I said, I have no problem with the new system that you talked about. It all comes down to caps. And in my comment that I just made, there has to be nimbleness and effectiveness to get interim funding to providers to be able to support their operations, because if we're waiting, it's not going to be able to make it. And that's the kind of the trend that we're going into right now. Thank you. Glenn, if I can just ask a quick follow up. Are you seeing any change, let's say, from, let's say, 
you know, early COVID, you know, um, early 2020 to now in terms of the number, the percent of contract workers you have to have, or is that base pretty much been a steady state and you and it has not dropped at all? Uh, David, uh, the um, contract nursing has exploded. So it, cont okay. it continues to grow. I mean, not, not the cost, but your need for your ratio of sort of contract to perm, does that continue at the same level, grow or decline? It is growing exponentially. We're talking double digit increases year to year on a minimum basis. The only way to support some of our facilities, we are 90% agency in some of our facilities. Oh my God. Okay. And so what happens is, this is the, the way that the industry is going. And I'm not going to get on my soapbox about how they're stealing our employees and making arrangements and then third party them back to us at four times the rate. That's not what I'm here to talk about. But I just need you to understand that this is exploding year to year. It is exponential. And so we are a labor industry. We care for people. We need people to serve and help. It's a very difficult industry. And every employee deserves everything they can get. But there is manipulation that I, I will not even discuss on this call on how difficult it is on what agencies are doing. And it is very, very dramatic. So there needs to be some consideration. And I mean, serious consideration when it comes to this, because regardless of the system you put in place, it will fail because there are so many outside pressures on the manipulation and use of agency and labor in the state of Maine right now. Thank you. And then just one quick follow-up. Is it RNs or CNAs that is the big pressure point? Or LPNs, is it? It's easy It's easy for me to say across the board. I mean, that's the easy out, but um, it really is um, the hospital pressures of taking RNs and LPNs in our industry is very great. Okay. Uh, there is a very large need for AIDS um, that we're experiencing, and I don't know about others, but it, it is, it is uh, very dramatic in the state. And I can tell you the numbers we're talking about are multi millions of dollars we're not talking thousands anymore thank you glenn appreciate that and just I, can thank i you. just can i just add to that because Please. it's not just on the nursing side it's in the assisted living meaning um crmas pss's and to glenn's point dietary now all of that is now we have to outsource a percentage of that in almost all of our facilities now and we never used to do that so it's at every level Should we move on to the last one, Danielle? Yes. Yeah. I wish we could get to all of them, but we only have less than 10 minutes left. So let's get to the third question. Um, and this is addressing if there are any gaps. And again, we probably already talked about this a little bit, but are there any gaps in the existing program design to highlight for the study team? So again, just please answer in the chat and then Justin will transfer them all over here. I'm seeing we had a lot of agreement to Glenn. I'm seeing you in the chat. So that's great getting everyone's feedback there. So is there anything we haven't touched on yet that we wanna make sure we hit on for this question? Okay, so I'm seeing I'm seeing some stuff coming in. So more agreements with Glenn and David. So paying for more costs every month. Number two is no program to fund training new clinical workers. That's definitely a gap. Reimbursements for dementia and behavioral needs is inaccurate, inadequate right now. Consulting services being part of the rate. Mentioned the need for financial incentives for anyone to get into this business. Yep, we did talk about that. 
And while answers are coming in, I wonder if someone could opine on number four, consulting services, if they are not need to be part of the rate. Sure, that was me. Um, and basically, I'm just saying, right now, our rates don't take into consideration that we're all paying for consulting. You know, meaning RNs and temp help and all of that. Oh, I see. Okay, gotcha. So, you know, if 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 that's going to remain and needs to be part of our assumed day to day of you know twenty, thirty, whatever percent, then that needs to be built into the the rate. All right, I see Angela, you wrote number seven, need to figure out a more nimble way to adjust rates to account for inflation. Yeah, uh, in our current system, we're tied to a specific index, uh, which is great. It means that it gets inflated at some point when we do rebasing, but it's not it's not real time, right? It's not nimble and reactive to um, the current set of inflation factors that providers are dealing with now. So I think that's something that we could try to address dur during uh, rate reform. Okay. I think there's some yeah. other comments here too, like like number 10. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah, I'm definitely seeing some commonalities here with nimbleness and inflation. Number 13 is interesting. Rick, you want to chime in? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, the, the one thing with the public health emergency, the critical nature of cash to the providers. We know in fee for service, you know, we've rendered the service in bill, but we have to pay payroll every two weeks or every week if you're on that payroll and the timeliness of it. And I don't know how we can address through this program and rate setting, the need for the providers to somehow get quicker access to the cash, especially in the situation we've been living with for the last two, three years. I mean, the state only covers us for what they deem to be reimbursable cash, we don't get paid all our AR. So as we've kind of said, it's kind of, it's very difficult to even break even in this industry right now. So all Nick, right, Danielle, I'm gonna jump in since we're down to just a couple of minutes left um, to kind of close things out. David, were you gonna say something? Yeah, this was going to really quick follow up with Rick. Is it is that a payment timing issue or payment amount issue? In other words, is it the sort of rate at which the state pays you or the amount that the state pays you? Well, I think it's all discussed like they don't pay everything for the lease. So okay, whether so you're in capital, you're not getting the lease. They make no consideration for the personal resource, the car share that we never get paid for the patient for things like that. There is no bad debt allowed allowance here. There is no profit factor allowed here. So we're only getting the Medicaid percentage of a, what they deem as reimbursable allowable cost. And then on your point about cost sharing, you're saying, you're, I mean, no surprise, you're having trouble collecting the patient's responsibility? Yes. And in, 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 I would, in, in some cases, could you just you know, high level sort of spitball what percent of the of the patient responsibility that you collect out of out of 100 percent of what you're due, what would you say you get of patient responsibility? I mean, it, it can be anywhere from one to three percent, depending on the center, depending on what the, the they're taking in, the type of patient that they're taking in. You collect one to three percent or you don't get one for three. To we don't get one to three okay. percent is sort okay. of the bad debt reserve model. Yeah. All right. Well, I want to uh, thank everyone today. This has been very helpful. This is exactly the kind of feedback that we are looking for as we start to develop this new rate methodology and address some of the concerns that you've all laid out today. So we will take away these uh, questions and comments and review um, and provide additional feedback and also take them into consideration as we're starting to build our methodology. 
And Justin, so, you can just, yeah, slide 18. Just so talk going about forward, yeah. um, work group meetings. So we want to meet with you as often as possible. And we've kind of laid it out right now as five separate meetings as we uh, present different topics. So today we did kind of the intro and the overview and got your general feedback. Um, sometime in April, we will plan for meeting two, which will focus more on data methodologies uh, in the rates uh, study, things like direct and indirect and capital costs as we get into kind of the base data. Uh, also in April, we'll do a presentation on trend to get more detail around the trend development. And then in May, we'll do two separate meetings on value-based purchasing and quality, um, and then also one on risk adjustment options. And then finally, we'll send a copy of the presentation out to everyone that's on the call today. And we did include, if you do have additional questions that you didn't get a chance to ask today, please send to, to Brian and myself. All right, we are right at time. Any last comments or questions? As a provider, I would encourage if the team uh, after the public health emergency is over, we would encourage that we'd like to promote to have you come to Maine if you're not already in Maine and come visit our facilities and see what's happening on the front line on a daily basis. And I think you'll be an eye-opening experience. That's something we can take under consideration. Thank you for the invitation, Glenn. David, uh, in addition to a copy of the presentation, you're also gonna send out the slides too. That would be super helpful. Yeah, yeah of course, yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. I really appreciate your time today. It's It's been a very useful uh, hour, and we appreciate all your uh, feedback and participation today. So thank you, and we look forward to meeting with you again uh, in a few weeks here. Thanks, thank everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.